Good morning. On behalf of the Student Council and Peer Leadership Council, I would like to welcome you to the last session of the 2021 Elgin Park Virtual Career Webinar. Today, I'm speaking on the shared traditional and unceded territory of the Katsi, Semiamu, and other Coast Salish peoples. To begin, my name is Rachel, and I'll be your coordinator for this session. Once again, we have our wonderful PLC and Stuco volunteers here as chat moderators and note takers. And now I'll be passing the mic to our student interviewer, Ruth, who will introduce our honored speaker today. Thank you. So our speaker here today is Dr. Catherine Evans. Ms. Evans holds a PhD in the philosophy of ethics and artificial intelligence from Sorbonne University in France. As well, she has a master's in political and ethical philosophy and an undergraduate in cinema studies and direction. Born and raised in Vancouver, now based in Paris, Katie is currently employed at UNESCO, aka the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. She worked as a creative lead, scientific expert, and screenwriter to develop a graphic novel about AI ethics, scheduled to release in early 2022. At this time, Ms. Evans concurrently works as a consultant, researcher, and policy advisor for multiple stakeholders in this field. We are extremely honored to have Dr. Evans here today. Although high school students like us aren't usually introduced to philosophy formally until much later, many of us are still very interested in this discipline, which makes this session even more invaluable to us. So please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Catherine Evans. Yay. Thank you. As a former former Elgin grad, like 10 years, I think, um, what was your motivation to pursue philosophy? And were you confident in your decision at first? Uh, OK, so <clears throat> my history with philosophy is a bit complicated. When I left Elgin, um, I thought that I was going to do a double undergraduate in arts and sciences at the University of McGill because I wanted to keep my options open. And so I had no idea what I wanted to do at all. Um, and then I, I got asked to participate uh, in a specialized program at the University of Toronto called the Trinity One Program for International Relations. And so that was really politics and diplomacy and sort of uh, the theory of international relations and economics. Um, and it was a very selective, very rigorous program, which uh, I think was a great opportunity for most kids but I hated it, um, I hated it. And so I, uh, I but I liked one of my professors uh, and after writing, I think the worst paper of my academic career on Vichy France, he called me into his office and he said, someone that thinks like you would enjoy working in France. <laughs> I had no idea really what that meant, but I thought he was a smart guy and at U of T there's all sorts of exchange programs available. So. I signed up for an exchange to Sciences Po Paris, which is sort of like their top political school in France um, and loved it. And I thought I was still, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I really wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know if that was really gonna be a career that was gonna be lucrative in any way. And so I stayed in politics. I went to Sciences Po, but then there they had um, philosophy of international relations, um, you know, moral philosophy, political philosophy. And so it was there that I started, I got my first sort of initiation into uh, philosophy and I loved it because um, a lot of times in school, we tend to teach sort of the practical aspects of what we're learning, but philosophy is all about concepts. Uh, and so it was really lovely for me to understand all of the concepts behind what I was learning for the past two years since I left high school. Uh, and I loved it so much that I kind of wanted to keep it and move forward with it. Um, but compared to a lot of my friends in Europe, they all have high, uh, they all have high school philosophy. It's like the, um, I don't know if you guys still have the 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 uh, province wide exams at the end where you have no okay well those were the days I had them and so in France it's the it's a countrywide exam for philosophy that you have to pass to be able to get your high school diploma that's how seriously they take it so I was really behind but I really liked it and so that's kind of how I got into it so I was not sure at all at all to answer your question 
I see. Yeah. I'm, I mean, we like literally celebrated when we didn't have the provincial exams anymore. We now only have the numeracy and the literacy exam, which is like, I don't know, like an advanced version, but like a lot less uh, material focus, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just have like just a follow up. Like, um, did you do French classes? Because like you went to French, France, right? And we have um, a French 10 class in attendance today. So could oh. you speak on that about like your French and yeah. Yes, that. I absolutely can. Yes. So now, I mean, obviously I, I've been living in France since I was 19. So that'll be 10 years in August. Um, so, so now I, yes, I'm, I speak fluent French today, but when I moved to France, I had, uh, I did French from all through high school into grade 12. So I had grade 12 French was the highest level that I had. And then I took it as an elective at the University of Toronto, but it wasn't very serious. Um, and so when I moved here, uh, I think it was initially kind of challenging because it's one thing to learn um, a language uh, sort of um, theoretically and another to apply it in real time with real speakers. But I can say that actually compared to a lot of the exchange students that I was with from all over the world when I was at Stone Spo, they, uh, I was really well off um, because grammatically, at least I really understood the language well. And so I would say after about a year and a half of living in France, my French was good enough to have French friends and go places and, uh -huh. and then after about three years, then my French was good enough to get a job. And then maybe five, like five years ago, I opened a translation company. So it sort of kind of exponentially improves, but the beginning is really rough, but it's really fun because you discover uh, who you are, um, because in your mother tongue, it's really easy to have conversations and be social because you know how you are, you know your little jokes and your little tricks, but to kind of do it all over again in your second language, and I'm sure a lot of people speak multiple languages that are here today, then you might know that you're a little bit, you know, um, stunted at the beginning, um, and it gives you a chance to really grow because you have to discover what parts of yourself you really want to translate into your second language and how to do that effectively. So, awesome. yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm really happy that like to it's reassuring to know that like because I took French 12, it's re reassuring to know that you can actually keep on with your French and actually like it's like would you say like French 12 and all the French courses prepares you really well for um what happened after graduation? Yes, I think I think um yeah, especially French 12 because that's when you understand the complex tenses and stuff. Yeah, I was not lost. I mean, I could read the signs. I could understand what people were saying to me. Uh, you know, I didn't have the guidebook with the how to order at a restaurant, <laughs> right? So, so it was it was good. I mean, you needed to to work on it and make it a bit more natural. But I wasn't completely lost only with French twelve. So I think that actually it's a really good, uh, yeah. If you know, it really does teach you a language. It's not just something you have to do in high school for sure. Yeah, yeah, I did pull a quick tangent for French show because like, hi, Madame Mendes. Yeah, so going back to our main topic, um, can you briefly talk about your research focus, specifically like the ethical valence theory? Like, huh? maybe just in like high school terms, I don't know. Yeah, okay, I might want to explain a little bit how I got to where I am, just sure. because my, my profile is a little bit bizarre. Because after I did the two years of politics, I quit uh, Sciences Po because I wanted to continue on, but they wanted me to start my degree over again for sort of administrative reasons. And I have student loans, so that wasn't possible. So to stay in France, I went to film school because that was sort of a passion that I never really explored in Canada. Um, and some of the teachers might remember I was quite artsy at the time. Um, and so I did two years of that, and that's where I kind of learned most of my French. And then after that, because I had a background at Sciences Po in a little bit of philosophy and I was quite good at it and I discovered that, then I snuck my way into a master's program in a public university in France, the Sorbonne, which is a very good university, but I didn't know at the time because uh, it costs about 200 euros a year to go. So you would think that it would be not great, but it's actually one of the top universities in France. Uh, and then I did pure philosophy for two years. Um, and then after that though, so I finished my master's and I had, you have, in your master's, you have to have um, a professor that oversees a big paper you have to write, which in French is called a memoir. And it's usually about 150 pages. It's like a master's dissertation. 
Um, and so they oversee you the whole year and you work on a research topic. And I had always been interested in robotics just because morally speaking, robotics opens up all sorts of sort of thorny questions about uh, what is right and wrong. How can you treat people? What is a relationship? You know, all sorts of stuff. So since the, since Sciences Po back when I was really young, that was something that I always thought was kind of fun to think about because it turns a lot of like really well-established moral norms and ideas on their head. Um, so I offered in my master's dissertation to do uh, my project on, on autonomous systems, autonomous weapons specifically, and a little bit of autonomous vehicles. And at the time I was the only person in my entire school that was addressing um, the ethics of robotics or AI, which is crazy because that was in 2015. So not that long ago, and you know, it's a pretty hot topic now. Uh, and so because of that, I had a lot of support and my professor found me a paid doctoral contract uh, for my doctorate. So that's great because I worked at an engineering, um, well, it's not, it's an institute. So it's basically a gigantic hub of engineers that are all working on autonomous vehicles. And I was the only philosopher and I was hired to work in that lab and then to work on a government project for the development of autonomous vehicles because France is really, really big into, you know, a smart energy transition and sort of all this stuff. So, uh, so basically my interest in philosophy combined with robotics and then I ended up getting, you know, shoehorned into this paid doctorate on autonomous vehicles, very strict, very specifically, where I worked alongside um, roboticists and engineers for about three or four years. And I just finished that in January. So, and then, uh, okay, and in terms of the ethical valence theory, this is a very thick concept. <laughs> um, but okay, I can explain it a little bit uh, compared to um, how what we might think. Okay, so the, the thing with autonomous vehicles is that they're supposed to drive better than humans. Everyone expects them to drive better than humans. Okay. Um, and that's pretty easy to accomplish in a lot of really mundane scenarios, like if you're just driving down the street and there's a, a dog that wants to cross and it's not at a crosswalk, well then the car stops for the dog and you know, no texting behind the wheel, no drunk driving, so it's pretty easy to beat human drivers most of the time, except uh, in cases where a collision is unavoidable, uh, it's difficult um, in, in a human case, you, it's kind of, you know, if you're, in, if you're about to get into an accident, then it's just a reaction that you have, you swerve or whatever. But since the autonomous vehicles, the, the processing power inside is so fast that it could actually make a real decision about how to crash and not just a reaction. And so because of that, the question is what decision should it make when it's about to crash? Because should it minimize life? Should it minimize, you know, legal questions like liability? Should it protect the passenger? Should it protect the, you know, the most vulnerable person? Maybe um, like, you know, if there's a kid versus an adult, well then, so then there comes the whole trolley dilemma sort of accident thing, which was kind of blowing up in the media over the past few years. So that's really the heart of my thesis. And a lot of responses professionally in the media and also academically revolve around using like old moral theories from the 1800s, 1600s, uh, and applying them. So, for instance, if Immanuel Kant, a big, big moral philosopher, said that, you know, you're, you're not allowed to use um, an individual as a means to an end, well, then we have to kind of try to apply that principle into uh, how a vehicle should drive. So it means that you can't ever injure someone to save someone's life, essentially. So a lot of people are just taking these old dusty theories and applying them into the vehicle context when I can tell you for certain that Immanuel Kant did not imagine his theory being applied to an autonomous vehicle. So it seems kind of stingy and often it doesn't align with what people, you know, regular people expect from their vehicle's behavior, you know, and sort of the moral standards that, that every society has. So my theory tries to find those moral standards that exist in society and to make compromises between the different people uh, in the vehicle's environment. So it tries to, instead of saying, okay, we're always gonna privilege children, always gonna privilege the elderly, no matter what the context, sorry, this lots of traffic, um, then we'll privilege the most vulnerable person, whoever that person might be. And so we break away from moral theory and lots of traditional kind of human moral reasoning and into something that's really designed specifically for autonomous vehicles. 
And so oh, that's a little yeah. bit the ethical valence theory. Valence because every individual in the traffic environment has sort of like an aura for the vehicle's vision. And so it, depending on the size of the aura, the car will drive closer or farther away to it, sort of. Uh, and so, so it's, a, it's a big chunk of cal calculating that goes behind that. But essentially, that's kind of what happens. Wow, yeah, I tried like maybe just skimming through one of your research papers. And the only thing I understood was a diagram where so you had like this, um, like this scenario when like either way there you're gonna crash into something. So what do you do? Yeah, so I guess that's a huge dilemma there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you answer the the next question I had, I guess I should have switched it, like about how did you come to researching this? So we're gonna go into the next. Um, what what are the dynamics within your research team like? And what is the typical research process in your field of expertise? Okay, this is a really interesting question for me to answer because typically philosophers don't work in teams. I mean, philosophy as a discipline is really, really solitary since since the ancient Greeks, frankly. Uh, so um, for me to work on an on a actual research team that had a project, we were building an actual physical autonomous vehicle with, with my moral theory inside of it, and that on a really tight time schedule with a lot of government money funding it was really, really practical compared to what you do typically in philosophy. And also that meant that I had to work, I mean, my team was five people. We were myself and my thesis supervisor, who was also a, a big moral philosopher. There was uh, Raja Shatila, who's one of, you know, Europe's top uh, roboticists and like a, 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 a amazing man. Um, so roboticist and his doctoral student. And then we had a, um, a behavioral psychologist that was doing sort of uh, traffic interaction, pedestrian uh, analysis and all that sort of stuff. So all that meant three different disciplines had to work together to make the project happen. And it was not easy and quite painful. And frankly, interdisciplinary research is a big problem in academia right now because most people are, are raised in their education to understand one paradigm. You know, you go to science, like you do your, your undergraduate in science, you're going to learn the scientific method, you're going to learn, you know, um, empiricism, all those things, and that's going to color how you see things moving forward. You're going to have terms that you learn, vocabulary, that are going to be set in stone for you, and if you only ever interact with scientists professionally, no one's ever going to question those terms. But when you work with other people who have all had different backgrounds and have different understandings of the same word, like democracy, for instance, um, then it becomes really difficult because you're kind of talking at, at, uh, at incompatible angles for almost the entire first year of the project was just us trying to understand each other um, and to not uh, sort of denigrate each other's ideas. Because as a philosopher, when I hear a, a psychologist talk about ethics, I think it's kind of, you know, superficial, but a psychologist, when I talk about, you know, um cognitive behavior she thinks that i'm an idiot so it <laughs> it's really difficult to find a common ground um and then once we did that the project went better although i have to say that this particular experience in my career was not a very positive one it was a very difficult project but um but the opportunity was wonderful so and i think as a as a, a point um that moving forward when you guys go to university and you want to pursue higher education I know that most universities now are trying to focus more on interdisciplinary work so that you're less just in this little silo by yourself and much more out in the open interacting with different uh, different students with different backgrounds. And that's a very good thing because it's difficult once they once professors end up to be 50, 60 and they're very set in their ways to open their horizons. Um, but uh, but maybe you guys, there's some hope there because you know we'll open those horizons when when that's still something that's possible. <laughs> yeah, that's actually like super fascinating because um, like I'm applying for university and like one of the things that I uh, was stressing most like the fact that you know I I would love to go into like the in interdisciplinary fields and like to think that even that's like there might be some like discrepancies between the different fields 
is something that I've never imagined would happen once you're in a research setting. Yeah. So, um, wow, hugely fascinating. Um, yeah. oh, oh my gosh. No, time is so fast. But uh, one more question before we move on into the Q&A session, because I know there are a lot of interesting questions out there as well. Um, I mean, just big one. Uh, I have nowhere to go, so. <laughs> oh, really? No, but like, uh, we have like an early dismissal today, so. Oh, no. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe just this one. What are the pros and cons of automated vehicles, and can they be hacked? Oh, okay, sure. So, yes, they can be hacked. Yes, they can be. Security is a huge problem in autonomous vehicles. Um, yeah, because someone can, uh, there's a couple of different ways you can hack an autonomous vehicle. You can hack it for data. So you can, you know, see where someone's been and, you know, how long they spent there. And, and so basically everything they do inside the vehicle and all the data that the vehicle is collecting uh, is made available to a third party. Um, that's, that's a big problem because your privacy is at, uh, at issue there um so but that's like the deeper version the more accessible version i think is is when someone remotely controls the vehicle because they can hack its um its operating um level of its system uh but that like i want to be clear that's not something that's going to happen to just you know jane doe who's taking her autonomous vehicle to the grocery store you know what i mean this is something that happens when someone has a vested interest in keeping you away from an area or moving you somewhere else and it's something that hopefully by the time autonomous vehicles become like a, a standard uh, issue thing that people buy when they're you know democratized so to speak that won't really be an issue so yes but in th yes they can be hacked um and in terms of benefits and risks of autonomous vehicles, well, I told you that they do drive better than humans. So there is a reduction in accidents. There is this little weird thing where the accidents are reduced, but then when you have a dilemma scenario, then you actually have to make a really uncomfortable moral choice about how to crash because you have to decide who you want to kill essentially. So there's that, that's kind of weird, but that's just morally uncomfortable for us because that's a new setting that technology has given us to think about things. Um, so that's one of them. Uh, oh, and, and something else that's interesting. So hum I say that, that a autonomous vehicles drive better than humans. That's true, except that there are some weird little um, sort of, I would say, technological mistakes that humans would never make. Um, for instance, a lot of the problems in autonomous vehicles have to do with their classification algorithms, so their machine vision. So they're going to look at all of the pixels in, in their cameras and try to identify objects and to predict their behavior. So you can identify a pedestrian and say, OK, that pedestrian looks like he's walking across the street. And so I'm going to I'm going to assume that he's going to continue walking into the future and drive the car around that. So the car does that in real time, except that Object classification in real-time environments is one of the biggest problems in robotics. It's really, really difficult to do. Uh, and so sometimes current autonomous vehicles that are in beta training uh, misclassify things. And that's led to a number of accidents, really sometimes fatal accidents. So, you know, a Tesla car, uh, will will you know uh, um be driving behind a truck and the reflection of the sun on the back of the truck blinds out its sensors and it thinks that it's uh that that you know that's a glitch and so it drives straight into the truck for instance no human driver would ever do that just like if you're driving along the highway at night one of the, the biggest car crash that happened was um a volvo that was in training so they had a trainer in the car who was watching the voice on her phone ironically enough and not paying attention to the road there was a woman carrying a bicycle that was driving uh, walking across the highway not at a pedestrian crosswalk so the vehicle sees this but the shape is funny because she doesn't look just like a pedestrian because she's wider because of the bike but not like a bike either because she's not on it and so the vehicle had no idea how to classify her and eventually it it thought it, she was a plastic bag, then nothing, then like a cactus, then a coyote, and then a plastic bag, and then nothing until she was about the car was about four seconds into yeah, not even four seconds before impact, um, and then it finally realized it was a human, but it was too late to stop the brakes and it ran her over. So, so there are let's say really interesting and problematic technological risks that come with better than human drivers, right? Because 
these are the sort of glitches that really need to be worked out before anyone can reasonably use this technology. In North America, especially the United States, everyone is very pro-progress, pro-technology, and so we're going to throw these cars out into the environment and get them to learn and train in real, in real life environments, whereas in Europe, we're very risk averse, and so there are no autonomous vehicles that are being trained on roads because of these risks. So, yeah, so it's a bit it's a bit funny, but I don't want to give the impression that any autonomous vehicle every day will make these sorts of errors. They're really like very critical errors that are quite rare, but they do happen. And because they're nothing like what the types of errors that human drivers make, it's really hard to predict them and to fix them before they happen. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's just so interesting. I see why you're so fascinated with the field. And quickly now, we're going to move on to Q&A because I see a bunch of questions. So and um, just a shout out to shout out to like the teachers. I'm not exactly sure when the class ends. So if you I, I think we might just go a little bit over time because like there's just so many questions. So if you need to leave, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um. Let me go back. So Michael, would you like to take over now? Yeah, yeah. So Naya is very interested in philo very interested in philosophy, but Naya is scared of not finding a job if if Naya persuades philosophy and he's thinking of doing a minor. And his question is, were you ever scared that it would be hard to find jobs pursuing philosophy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, I was afraid. Uh, and I know that when, I mean, I, I was, I went from a top tier political school where I should have been, you know, an amazing political journalist or something or some kind of diplomat. And then I went to film school and I did philosophy. So I had a lot of people tell me, oh, what are you going to do with that? Video? What's that good for? But um, philosophy, let me tell you a little plug for it, I think is one of the best things that you can give yourself in your formal education, because it teaches you to think outside of the box, which going forward in the way that technology is interacting with employment into the future, to be able to think across multiple paradigms, to be able to understand um, complex concepts and kind of wear them like hats and then switch them instead of just having the one hat you went to school for is going to be a really, really useful skill set for anybody to have. It teaches you to think and critically analyze the world. It protects you from disinformation and problematic content online because you develop your critical thinking skills. And, and it's hard because it's like in France, philosophy it has a way different rap than it does in North America. Here, philosophy is one of the hardest things you can take. Most people think it's harder than math, right? So then you have the status of someone who's doing science, even though you're doing philosophy in France. And so to hire a philosopher here makes sense because on a lot of interdisciplinary teams in all sorts of uh, private and public sector jobs, you need to have someone who can bridge the gap between all of these different people who have different visions of things. And to do that, you have to have a transversal understanding of the world and philosophy gives you that. So I would say that it's absolutely worth it to trust yourself and to think out of the box if it's something that you're passionate about because you will be able to apply it. Um, and I certainly have. I mean, I'm writing a comic book at UNESCO because I'm a philosopher. Who knows, right? Uh, I worked on autonomous vehicles because I was a philosopher. A lot, I mean, I, I had almost a scientific aspect of my life with absolutely no scientific background, just with philosophy. So you can do a lot with it if you're willing to take some risks and think outside of the box. Yeah, I think so too. I think philosophy is one of, one of the first fields and all the other subjects kind of branched branch down from, from philosophy, right? That is absolutely correct, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Naya also asked, is there any way that high schoolers can get involved in research such as this? Uh, such as philosophy or autonomous vehicles, that kind of stuff? Mm, probably philosoph philosophy, yeah. Yeah, well, yes. The great thing about philosophy is that most of the, the greatest 20th century philosophers gave themselves most of their training. So uh, it's really easy to um, start to read because what they're going to do in your undergraduate is introduce you to all of the great thinkers that have ever existed from the ancient Greeks until today. And you're just exposed to their ideas and you kind of play with their arguments and see if you agree with them or not. So you can read these books um, 
pretty easily. They're never that expensive because uh, they're, you know, classic literature. And that I think it's, um, it's great because it gives you what happens at the, when you start doing philosophy, you have what's called like a disenchantment, which is sort of the world is much more complex than you thought. And, and you'll understand a bit that you'll never really understand it the way you think. So it can be a little bit um, uh, unsettling to have the initial exposure to philosophy because you understand how, how complex concepts can get, right? Uh, so you absolutely can start that process. Um, and all you have to do is just look up every penguin classic in philosophy and read it. And then not only will you have a huge head start when you get to university, but you'll actually figure out which authors you like and maybe what tradition you want to kind of cling to moving forward. Like I'm, I come from a more economic approach to philosophy. I'm a big fan of Mill and of Smith and a lot of 20th and 18th to 20th century philosophers that talked about political philosophy. But there's all sorts of different strains. You can talk about the philosophy of science, um, the philosophy of just about anything, of mathematics, of physics. Uh, so it, you know, YouTube right now is an amazing resource to understand maybe what type of philosophy you're interested in, because there's all sorts of sort of little online learning modules or uh, that you can start with. And once you know that, then read the classics and what aspect of philosophy you're interested in. And that's how it goes at university anyways. Yeah, philosophy works are really interesting. I, I was actually reading um, The Republic by Plato. It's quite interesting. And Ro Rosemary Rollins asked, is your graphic novel in French or English? What's the title? Did you do the artwork or work with someone? Uh, okay, so the, the graphic novel is in both English and French, but two separate versions, not together. Um, the title is called System Preferences, but the it's a science fiction story that it, the pitch is basically um, four people at the same time in different corners of the planet um, are interacting with AI devices and make a mistake. You know, they, they don't accept the cookies or uh, they, they don't download something into the cloud and, and the system sucks them through the screen and they end up behind the screen in this zany AI planet called Plether AI. So, uh, and there they meet all sorts of the, the algorithmic characters that are actually behind the technology that they're um, interacting with. And so they understand the machine and their issue and then find a way to get out together. So, uh, so yes, I am responsible for the scientific content and for the screenwriting, because bizarrely, I have a background in both of those things. Um, and then I have a team of four different illustrators to do the, the, the artwork because the book is about a hundred pages long, give or take. And I, I might, I have many hats, but I'm not a comic book illustrator. I can't, I'm not a one woman band. So, <laughs> uh, so that I have to delegate, but, um, Yes, no, it's a really exciting project with lots of institutional support. Uh, and I think that I hope, you know, it'll help kids understand a little bit more about what actually happens behind their screens. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah. So another question on the lighter side, Mr. Day asked, what are your favorite AI robot movies or novels? Oh, um, okay. Uh... I'm actually a fan of Asimov as a writer, the iRobot movie with Will Smith. I don't, I don't know. Um, so the Asimov, uh, like a robot dreams, all of that series of short stories is really good because he plays with a lot of different moral questions that are still pertinent today. I think my favorite book that is AI related, but not directly is called Player Piano and it's by Kurt Vonnegut, who is a pretty prolific writer. Uh, and it, it takes place in a society where it's sort of not machines necessarily, but automation itself has kind of taken over all of the workforce of a society. And so people are just kind of free to do whatever they want. And it's not a utopia, it's super boring. And he explores that theme and what it does to human nature. Uh, so I think, uh, I think that that's a good one, my favorite. And if not in terms of movies, um, I didn't like Ex Machina, the one that came out a couple of years ago. I thought it was a little bit simple but there's lots the the love war and robots uh, series of short films on netflix that just came out with the new season a couple of days ago that stuff is really good it's not educational but i find that they play with the technological themes in really interesting ways 
um, that, that don't kind of align with this typical sort of doomsday, we built a machine to help us and it ends up dominating us for our own good thing. I think we can do away with that narrative. It's not all that productive right now because that's not the, the, the threat that's immediately facing humanity today about technology. True. Like our technology is advancing and Mr. Day is wondering how long will it be until, do you think there will be more self-driving cars on the streets than human driven cars? And how long uh, do you think it will take before this is a reality? Okay, uh, projections right now, um, most autonomous vehicles will have what's called some market penetration in around 2050 because uh, it takes a while for all of different societies to adopt these cars, but it also takes a while for people to need a new car um, because people don't buy cars every year, right? So uh, we'll say that there's going to be what's called a mixed fleet starting in the 2040s, 2050s, where there's humans and uh, robots driving on the same roads, which is really problematic because of, you know, because of the interaction between the two. But then at around 2070, people think that it'll be predominantly, if not exclusively, um, robot cars. In that case, human driving either becomes a thing of the past naturally or is forbidden in at least some areas, especially because once it's mostly, if not all robot drivers on the roads, um, accidents really will be a thing of the past because the cars communicate with each other. The problem is the robot cars having to interpret, understand and communicate with human drivers, human pedestrians, et cetera, because they can't communicate as efficiently as they can with each other. So 2070 will be when, when we see the robotic car future that Tesla talks about like it's happening tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, I believe so too. If all the cars are robotic and run by like a single system, I think it would be much more safer. Mm -hmm. It would be, yeah. If once all the cars are of the same you know, degree of complexity and they're all robotic and they can all communicate in real time, then it will be safer, yeah. And then you can drive your old 1950s sport car somewhere in the, the middle of the country roads, but not on public roads or highways. I, a lot of people think that they're gonna make um, human driving illegal over time, but that's such a long-term projection. I think it's really important when we're talking about technology, not to, to get all uh, swami swami about it. Like we shouldn't pretend that as a philosopher, I'm a fortune teller because a lot of people have made some pretty wacky predictions about what's gonna happen in AI and they're very consistently wrong about those. So that's what the research says, whether I believe that that's gonna be the way that it goes, I don't really know, we'll see. Cause autonomous vehicles aren't as fun as, as some people think they are. They're still very buzz, buzzworthy right now, but I think uh, in a lot of ways, they're kind of boring having been in one myself, yeah. Oh, really? I'm looking forward to it. It's quite new to me. Yeah, yeah. What's boring when I say that is just that they're so careful the way they're programmed today. You know, uh -huh. they'll stop for everything and they never go beyond the speed limit. And they're like, you have to wear your seatbelt and you have to, you know, they're, they're like, uh, you're driving with your parents kind of in the car and you're, you know, very risk averse parents and you're kind of like, I wanna go on the open road. So <laughs> I think moving forward, they might be a little bit more um, chill, so to speak, but right now they're programmed like, uh, like you know, your grandma's driving, so. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Rowling's asked if your novel is available in Canada and if, th if it is, where? Okay, so it's coming out in January 2022, so it's not available anywhere yet, um, but uh, actually this just changed this week, um, so it'll be out um, digitally on the UNESCO platform that they're going to build for it, so on the UNESCO website and all over social media, but it'll come out in print at the same time, but I don't know what editing house we're going with yet because we're discussing that this week. Um, but it will be available. It's meant to be really a global book because that's UNESCO's mandate. They have to make it accessible to everyone on the planet, both in terms of actual physical accessibility and also in terms of how, what kind of things we say and what we mean, et cetera. So, uh, so yes, it will definitely exist in Canada, but I can't say right now exactly how. Mm, yeah. So if anyone's interested in philosophy, make sure to check it out. Uh, we, we're going to end with one last question because we're going to be a bit short, short on time. Ma Max asked, 
AI should think like a consequentialist when dealing with critical situation instead of following categorical moral principles at a time when AI can decide whether a person lives or dies. How do we ensure that AI's actions are righteous and justice ones? Good for you, Max. That's a pretty complex question. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, so that, that's right. You absolutely understood my distinction between consequentialism and categorical imperatives. This might be a little bit highbrow for some of us, but I'll try to keep it uh, accessible. Um, so the thing is, you, you have to think about uh, this like a consequentialist, which what that means is you have to think about the consequences of the action you're doing. What matters morally to a consequentialist is what happens in the world, not who makes it happen, why they made it happen, and any other mitigating circumstance. All that matters is the results. That's a consequentialist, okay? So because of the nature of autonomous vehicles themselves, they don't have any motivations. They don't have any moral core. They don't have any personal principles. So does it make sense to say that they can really apply anything else besides a consequentialist type of reasoning, especially because autonomous vehicles care about results because results result in accidents or not, right? Uh, but the question is, a lot of consequentialist paradigms like utilitarianism, the most popular consequentialist uh, concept, and that's, you know, we should maximize pleasure, maximize happiness. So look at the results and pick the result that gives everyone the most happiness. That's utilitarianism. The problem is, Happiness, pleasure, or even safety, if we were to translate it into the vehicle context, isn't the only thing that matters to people. It also matters, you know, who's legally responsible for the accident, whether or not the person that ends up getting hit by the car was, let's say, on the sidewalk versus in the actual traffic lane. You know, were they involved in the accident anyway? Whether or not the person that gets injured is the passenger, therefore owning the vehicle, because it seems kind of strange to buy something that could kill you and purposely kill you. I don't know a lot of people who would do that. Uh, so the idea is take the consequentialist paradigm, and this is exactly what the, my theory, the, the um, ethical valence theory does, is to take consequentialism and try, instead of thinking of only one criterion to maximize, we think of a bunch, as many as we can and try to maximize them across each other. So the one that I picked as an example is vulnerability. So we try to look at, of all the people who could be harmed in an accident, um, which ones are most likely to be the most seriously harmed, not just in virtue of their physical uh, relationship to the vehicle, like how far away they are, but also because of their age and their gender and the type of car they're driving, uh, because it makes them more or less vulnerable to an impact with the vehicle. And so then we try to privilege, for instance, the most vulnerable person. Um, but we could also say, okay, we're gonna privilege the most vulnerable person uh, unless it's gonna kill the passenger. And so we'll make a trade off. So there's all sorts of different ways to mix up moral principles and practices. And I think the biggest mistake thus far has just been to not do that. And that's what I tried to do in, uh, in my stuff. And the questions of justice and um, righteousness, let's say, are very, very relative. What people think is fair in North America is really different from what people think is fair in, in France, for instance. And in fact, a really interesting study come out, uh, came out in 2016 and then in 2019 by uh, MIT um, called the Moral Machine Experiment. I would invite you guys all to go take a look at that. I don't know if you can still do it, but for a long time, you could choose how you would decide in dilemma scenarios with different people. You were like pretending to be the car, so to speak. And it shows how but what people's approval of different AV decisions are across the globe. I think it had something like 140 million um, uh, test subjects. So it's one of the biggest empirical studies to ever have been conducted on the planet. And it's really interesting to see how um, morals, the moral sense, the moral nose kind of changes across different societies and what matters and what matters less. So it's a very big question, and I think it has to be answered at a local, maybe national level, but nothing higher than that. Wow, that was really insightful and interesting for all of us. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it back to Rachel. Perfect. Yep, thank you, Michael. And uh, this officially concludes our virtual career webinar week. I would like to once again thank our speaker, Dr. Catherine Evans, for taking the time to join us today. I'm sure many of us were inspired by your stories and experiences. I hope that our students have gained insight in your career and the importance of following your interests. 
and everyone could always check out the uh, Moro Machine Project. And now uh, a big thank you to everyone who joined us for this week. A big shout out to all the teachers who joined multiple sessions throughout the week. We appreciate it so much. And a special thank you to Mr. Leader, Ms. Wagner, Mr. Johnstone, and Mr. Kwan for always supporting our causes. And to our sponsor teachers, Mr. Day, Ms. Jansen, and Ms. Spencer, we are so grateful for your unconditional support. We truly couldn't have done it without you. And lastly, to all of our volunteers, thank you for showing such commitment for our event. We recognize your hard work. And if you enjoyed this event, please check out our Instagram, EPS Duco and EPS underscore PLC underscore. That's EPS Duco and EPS underscore PLC underscore for more events in the future. And that officially concludes the virtual career webinar. Thank you all so much for coming. You're free to log out now. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.